Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Digital Hammurabi. Thank you so much for joining us on this, what, Wednesday? Probably Wednesday. Who knows? It's a day. Time is a construct. It's all fine. I am your host, uh, Megan Lewis, and today I am joined by Kelsey Ehalt. I have no idea if I just said your last name correctly. It's so Ehalt. Yeah, Ehalt. yeah I, I realized I should have said that was one of the things. I, <laughs> I normally ask. I normally ask, honestly. I was like, oh, no, this is fine. I've got this. And then I'm, I've been called everything. So. <laughs> well, Kelsey, why don't you uh, kind of introduce yourself? who are you where are you what do you do and like why do you do it it's it's a yeah <laughs> these are all great questions uh hi i'm kelsey ehalt um i'm a second year phd student at the university of michigan right now in the middle east studies department um i do acadian mostly if someone asks like what do you do i do a lot of different things i have a lot of different interests but mostly i work with the acadian language working on sumerian it's a challenge um but I am most interested in gender in Mesopotamian culture. How does gender work? What types of language are they using to deal with gender? The complicatedness of all of that. Um, and then recently I've worked um, on a project and I'm work working on a project on uh, the symbolism of dogs connected with masculinity. So animal symbolism is rolling into this too. I haven't picked my dissertation topic yet, but I'm thinking it's going to lean toward the animal direction. We'll see. Um, yeah. Uh, that, so, no, that's perfect. How yeah, did you get, was, how did you get to a Syriology? Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I didn't expect to be here. Uh, if you had asked me five years ago, I wouldn't have guessed that this was what I was doing. Um, so as, as a kid, I was I wasn't one of those people who always wanted to be an Assyriologist or I, I was always to be fair in, I think there are about three of those yes Egyptology that tends to be more like oh since I was a kid yeah. I was interested Egyptology in Mesopotamia there's just not as much stuff for kids out there um which is interesting that's a whole other thing but um yeah so as a kid I was always interested in weirdly specific things I've always had particular interests that are sparked by the strangest things so I just sort of follow interests where they lead me. Um, but by the time I got to college, um, I went to GW and I was planning on majoring in political science and physics, wanting to do some sort of nuclear policy, but have the physics background to understand it. Theoretically, that's that's how I, I wanted it to go. Turned out I didn't like uh, college math classes at all. I found that out like the second day of class. I was like, uh, no, thank you. Um, and so I quickly realized that physics wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. Um, and so I was sticking with poli sci. I'm interested in history, interested in political theory. Um, but then my sophomore year at GW, I took a class on textual forgeries, mostly biblical forgeries like the Nacia Stila and mm -hmm. the Jesus Wife Papyrus, things like that, which are all fun stories. Um, but that's what really got me into studying the ancient world. So I took that class and I was like, oh, wow, this is something that I could actually do. And it's stuff that I don't know about. And um, want to learn about. So I sort of just dove in. Um, and then that next summer I went on a dig. So I got the the field work side of things and I realized I liked that too. Um, so my undergraduate degree is in archaeology, but I wanted to work with texts primarily. And so Akkadian classes are are limited in the world and GW didn't have Akkadian. So I took Arabic for my language requirement. But then I did a, a master's program after that for two years at Brandeis where I cracked down on the ancient Semitic languages I've done. So this is my seventh semester of Akkadian. And then I did Hittite and Ugaritic and all, all those. But the master's program was to really crack down on languages. And also, I was in the, the joint program between the Near Eastern and Judaic Studies departments and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies department. So I was trying to balance the philology, the language side of things with mm -hmm. the theoretical considerations, which that's what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> today um but balancing those things is is tricky i think because they are both fairly technical and i'm trying to do my best to be proficient maybe not great at, at both of them but you know to avoid the jack of all trades master of, of none mm -hmm. trope um yeah so that's what that's what i'm working on now that was a lot <laughs> no that's awesome and perfect thank you um so I invited Kelsey on to talk about theory because theory is one of those things that is incredibly important and very, very useful. But I have little to no understanding of exactly how to apply it. 
uh, which is uh, why I'm doing YouTube and not teaching classes somewhere. Uh, actually, that's that's only partially true. Um, but I thought Kelsey would be a really helpful person to kind of explain it to me and helpfully explain it to all of you lovely people. Um, if you know what theory is, then I'm, I'm super sorry. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not up there with you. So Kelsey, what is theory, specifically yeah. theory in the, the application of historical studies? Yeah. So when I, when I saw that you had named this video, what is theory? I knew that that was going to be the first question we were going to ask. And I was thinking last night, how am I going to answer this question? Um, because it's it's a lot of different things. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to focus on what I'm doing and what I'm familiar with mostly, but add the caveat that theory can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but one of the first things I thought of was, I think it's interesting that in, in popular culture, when someone says theory, it's either one derogatory, like, oh, that's just a theory. Like, <laughs> It's not serious. It's, it's just not a theory. Fact. Or on the other side of the spectrum, it's theory. That's a scary, complicated thing. And I don't understand it like what you've talked about. And that was my feeling at mm -hmm. first. And still now, sometimes um, it can be a lot and very dense and requires a lot of accumulated knowledge. And it just takes time to wade through everything and figure out what is going on. But I think what I landed on to give my like brief sentence definition of what theory is. Theory for me is just being honest and transparent and hopefully structured um, in laying out what your assumptions and arguments are in a paper. I think that's how I use theory. It's not any sort of questioning the existence of <laughs> of anything or I mean sometimes sometimes we are questioning the exist existence of assumptions of things but it, it doesn't have to be something scary about like questioning the the underlying meaning of life it doesn't have to be the deep philosophy type things it can just be about being very clear about the language that you're using why are you choosing to use one word or another um being clear about the context in which you are operating as a modern scholar. How do structures of power influence how you think about the world, in our modern world? And then how does that in turn reflect and influence how we think about the ancient world, which is a whole separate context? And how do looking at those contexts specifically, how are those things, how does that shape how we think about both ourselves and the ancient world because nothing that we study exists in a vacuum sometimes it would be nice if we could just read a text <laughs> and understand exactly what they were talking about and just be able to say like yeah that's that's what it means but that's not how philology and history works and that's not how the world works unfortunately not yet i don't know maybe the future holds something that we don't understand yet but we have to think about all of the historical context, social context, structures of oppression, violence, all of these things that influence both ourselves in the modern world and how we do our work, but then influence how we talk about the ancient world. And then the flip side too, how, how we talk about the ancient world influences the modern world too. So just thinking very carefully about what the impact of our studies are or what the impact is um and being just a little bit more careful than you know the 19th century seriologists who were just going and taking stuff because it was cool um and really thinking about how we can know things and how our knowledge is influenced by our present context and how our present context is different than the context that we're studying and being honest about the limits of our knowledge. Some things we just can't know and we have to sit with that and be uncomfortable with that and it sucks. <laughs> but we just, we can't know everything about the ancient world because of the difference in context, the thousands of years of temporal time <laughs> and, um, and, and structural things. Like we have access to certain information because of how power structures functioned in the past. And some people didn't have access to writing or if they did write, we don't have access to the materials that they wrote on, things like that. So that was a lot, but 
again, <laughs> I just start rambling. You can stop me at any point. No, no, it's great. It's all um, very helpful and interesting. Good. Um, but yeah, it just, at the end of the day, it's just about being honest and transparent about where we're coming from as scholars and how, how we're making arguments, how we know things, how we're interpreting things, and not just saying that this is what happened in the past, end of sentence, saying mm -hmm. it's a little bit more than that. Yeah. So if then you're um, working on something and you're trying to use, I don't know, a feminist theory or looking at it with gender theory, yeah. how does that then work? Uh, that, that's good, because I missed the, another part of it. But theory can also be about how you're framing what you're talking about. Whenever we're talking about any part of the ancient world, we can't talk about we can't realistically talk about every aspect of everything that happened in the past. We have to limit our arguments and what we're talking about somehow. And one way to do this is through topics like gender. So I'm going to talk about gender in this period and not about, I don't know, administrative tech. I mean, gender can be involved there. Gender can mm. be involved in lots of different things, but... But looking at the, at the gender right. rather than maybe uh, economic power structures. Right, exactly. Unless it, those economic power structures are influenced by gender, in right. which case you go for it. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, everything's all intertangled and entangled, um, and it's a big mess of everything. Stuff. But it's Yeah, but it's about um, the frame that you're using to look at whatever you're looking at, be it the first millennium or third millennium, like whatever period of history or modern history, whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's the difference between saying, I am going to look at this time period in terms of gender and how that impacts and influences the history and events and, and what right. I'm looking at. And I'm looking at the same time period, but looking at it through like a Marxist lens right. and considering like- Then you're going to be talking that about kind of thing. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. then yeah, those two approaches would be there very different. And just using the term like, okay, I'm doing a Marxist analysis versus a feminist analysis. Those are just almost just shorthand. So you don't have to say like. <laughs> Every time um, you say it, keep yeah, like explain out. like, okay, like what mm -hmm. does it mean to do a materialist historical analysis of whatever? We can just say Marxist and that kind of envelops everything. And obviously when it comes to gender, there's a lot of different approaches to how we talk about gender. There's feminist analysis, which is one thing. And that's mostly. I interpret, and someone who does feminist analysis could obviously disagree with me, but I interpret feminist analysis versus queer analysis to be a centering of women rather than a centering and analysis of categories as they exist. Um, so a, a cent it, 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 again, it's, it's about framing and highlighting one thing in the grand scheme of the entire world that we're looking at and centering that in your analysis and maybe explaining why it's important to center that and it hasn't been centered in the past. Um, the analogy that I used, I, I taught a class on introduction to social scientific theory during my master's program and the, the analogy that I used for my students was a, a literal frame like for a painting or a photograph mm -hmm. or something. When you take a picture, you paint a picture, you're capturing part of an entire scene. You can't take a picture of the entire world. You're just capturing one slice of something. And maybe you're centering one person or you're centering whatever you choose to be the subject of your painting mm -hmm. picture, whatever, is how you're, and how you frame it, literally frame a, a painting, is how, and being honest about like why you chose to pick one thing or another and how you're limiting, how you're creating a frame around this slice of the world. That's basically what like a theoretical like framework would be. Um, it's just, it, like, like I said, it's being honest about mm -hmm. the, the limits that we have as scholars, instead of trying to claim that we can know everything about everything in the past and we can write a book about as many things as possible. It's being a little bit more specific and centering one thing or another or analyzing and critiquing a certain concept or another, just being focused and clearer with what our goals are. Thank you. I assume that also has an impact on exactly what evidence you choose to yeah. look at. I'm thinking about um, if you're trying to write a book of history 
Mesopotamian history, you've got Mont van der Meer upon the one hand, which yeah. is a fantastic political history. But then um, Amanda Patani just came out with another one whose title eludes me at the moment. It's sitting on yeah. our desk and I, I, yeah. I haven't read it yet. But from what I like reading the back and reading other people's reviews of it, that's looking much more at history through um, the lived experiences of ordinary people. Yeah instead of a political history they're both histories they're both right. looking at the history of mesopotamia yep. but it's it's framing that history differently yeah and it's also going off of this it, it's acknowledging that there's more than one history there's not yeah. one unified history of mesopotamia that anyone could write um there's not one unified set of experiences of any one you know within any one group that you could pick everything's going to be diverse so it, it's Theory is also about acknowledging and dealing with, in a hopefully structured way, dealing with the complicatedness of everything. And I think this, this is what sets postmodernism apart from modernism. And those are, you know, two theory buzzwords. But modernism being sort of the general idea that we're on an upward trajectory throughout history things now are better than they have been in the past and yeah that's true if you maybe look at certain groups of people mm -hmm. but if you look at the grand scheme of things it's certainly more complicated than that and so postmodernism is really about challenging that one unified narrative of things are better than they were in the past and looking at the complicatedness of human experience mm -hmm. now and in the past and how all of those things are then filtered through the evidence that we have to look at them. That's the other thing too, is like, we can't just go and talk to an Acadian speaker. That would be really nice. One day. Yeah. One day. Oh, oh, one day. Um, it'd be really nice. And that would totally change how Assyriology is done. And that's why history is different from psychology or um, and that, that, that's how I distinguish social science and humanities too. Uh, social science is more dealing with the humans themselves and humanities is dealing with the products of the humans. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it, it's thinking about how there's no one unified truth that we can attempt to find. Mm -hmm. um, and just acknowledging that the sum of looking at the parts and the sum of the parts is is more the way to do it as opposed to just trying to find like oh like what is true in the past uh, yeah it might have been true for one person but not for mm -hmm. everyone yeah thank you so then um how does all of that all of the things play into your current research projects because that does sound very interesting yeah so the dog project um I presented it at, in Helsinki a few months ago, actually, and I have to submit it for uh, peer review. But it was looking at a couple of case studies. One, um, very briefly, I need to <laughs> look more into it, but Gula, the, the goddess who's associated with healing in dogs, she's marked pretty normatively as feminine. Mm -hmm. But then also the royal lion hunt of the Neo-Assyrian period, specifically the reliefs of the palace of Ashurbanipal and how dogs show up there. Because it's interesting that dogs only, sh that dogs show up a few times. And when their handler, so there's, a, there's not a consistency with how their handlers are depicted. Sometimes the handlers have beards and sometimes they don't. But interestingly, when the dogs are like actually confronting the lions, the handlers have beards. And when they're mm -hmm. just like going back and forth, between the pals, presumably, and the, the wherever they're doing the lion hunt, then the handlers don't have beards. So that was strange to me. And I've recently looked at a lot of the literature, well, there's not a lot, but some of the articles that have been published and just mentions here and there in different articles where people make the argument, and maybe it's not an argument, make the assumption that if uh, someone is depicted without a beard, especially in the royal court, that they're a eunuch. That's something that shows up fairly commonly, more commonly than I'd like to see, mm -hmm. and is really troubling to me. Like, how could we possibly know that someone who has no text associated with them on this relief, that because they don't have a beard, that they're also a eunuch? That's, it's not a 
cohesive argument in my mind. And so when I was looking at this, I noticed that there was the difference in the depiction of the handlers of the dogs at the um, in the lion hunt relief. So I started looking at this. And then there are also a bunch of different attestations of dog being used as a nice term. Well, there's a lot of things. Being called a dog is not usually nice. There's a lot of things about that. But then in the seventh century, there's a lot of attestations of dog being used positively for royal employees specifically. So then that got me thinking, okay, these are in the reliefs and in the letters, these are employees working for the king. How does masculinity fit into this? Beards being a symbol mm -hmm. of masculinity. Um, and so I've sort of landed on the argument now and I'm still fleshing it out that dogs are then symbolic of complicit masculinity, not of hegemonic masculinity. Can you define those for yeah. us? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, hegemonic masculinity being whatever, it, it depends on the context that we're talking about. Um, whatever, like the historical context that we're talking about, it whatever is considered to be the ideal form of a man. So in the modern period, I in the PowerPoint that I did, I, I have a picture of this like uh, it's a it's milk i think it's milk or like a protein shake advertisement for a magazine of this this muscular guy hanging mm. off a mountain he's like be a real man drink whatever this <laughs> is it's great and so that in the modern period apparently is what an ideal man is it's a muscular guy hanging off a cliff but in text from the first millennium the the evidence that we have indicates that the king is framing himself as the ideal man. Mm -hmm. And then, so if whatever the, that image is bearded or not, or muscular or not, bearded and muscular, that's the, the first millennium Akkadian kings, definitely what they're going for. But then there are other types of masculinity too. And that's, I, I pulled a couple books that I thought I might talk about, but the, mm -hmm. this comes from uh, Raywin Connell's book, Gender. And she's doing analysis of multiple masculinities existing. And so she delineates hegemonic masculinity versus there's a few other types, but I'm just dealing with hegemonic and complicit. And so if hegemonic is the ideal, complicit is not necessarily the same as the ideal, but it up upholds the power structures that favor the hegemonic masculine. And so in this case, these would be all the royal employees who don't perform masculinity in the same way that the king does. They don't have beards necessarily sometimes mm -hmm. they do but they assist they in the king's performance right they're not necessarily the same sort of masculine tough guy that the king is but they are directly serving to uphold the structures that favor the king's power and the maintenance of his masculinity his masculine image as the ideal mm -hmm. so with this i found that dogs and then the third case study that i looked at is the demon lamashtu Who's associated with dogs in her image and also when you get when you're trying to get rid of her you can marry her off to a dog or there's different rituals with um sort of pairing her with uh, ceramic figurines of dogs mm -hmm. and so here these dogs are more closely associated with complicit masculinity in it's clearest in the the lion hunt um images where the dogs are so, like directly tools of the king. They're mm -hmm. they're like there's a relief of Asher Ben with like um, a bow and arrow shooting at the lions, and the dogs are right there, like with the arrows. They're literally tools of the king, serving to maintain his image as the the, the, the tough, mm -hmm. cool king who can fight the lions and has power over the wild and um, untamed side of the world. But then with Lamashtu, it gets a little bit more complicated because then dogs are sort of part of her own image as being feminine. She's coded as feminine, like mm -hmm. the word munis is used to describe her as uh, and Duma munis sometimes, only when it's her name is written syllabically, not as Dimme Ten, which is a whole other thing, which is interesting. Um, but dogs are then part of her image as being monstrous. She's not human because she has dog teeth or a mm -hmm. dog head or bird feet. 
Um, and so the association with her and animals, specifically dogs, is part of what makes her not human and therefore monstrous and scary, although there's, there's more that makes her scary. Um, but then are in opposition to her normative femininity. She's not feminine because she's like a dog. Mm -hmm. And then the way you get rid of her too is you marry her off to a dog, so which is sort of, I'm, I'm still working on this. this. This is tricky to me. I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure how I want to deal with this in the, the broader argument of dogs being complicitly masculine. But it's about a, they're mediating her monstrosity. Mm -hmm. they, they're controlling her and taming her, which is part of what masculinity, complicit masculinity does. It's, it's mm -hmm. taming the things that could be threats to hegemonic masculinity. So still in progress, but there's, there's a lot here. And there's not a lot of work that's been done just at all on mm -hmm. gender and dogs um, and looking at those connections. There's one, there's a, and just animals and, and gender, there's not a ton. I'm still looking at what else is out there for different periods, but it's really interesting. There's, there's a lot of different things to think about. That does sound interesting. Yeah. So how, and recognizing this is a work in progress, um, how do you think Gula plays into that? Yeah. I don't have a great <laughs> argument for this yet. Um, it seems to me, and I am still looking through all the texts, that Gula is just pretty normatively feminine. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that really makes her non-normative or makes me think that she would be considered non-normative. Um, she's not described in any way that like it seems to be at odds with a, a normative femininity. But the, the healing connection and the dogs as mediators between the divine and the human seems to be mm -hmm. important. And this mediation, again, is part of what complicit masculinity is. It's mediating between the ideal form of, of masculinity and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and really about sort of operating between two things without really belonging to one category and another themselves. Do you think the um, uh, apotreic dog figurines that get buried under houses are kind of serving that role as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because some of those are directly connected to Gula. Um, but yeah, again, it's, it's about this liminality between, because the, they're buried under threshold, so between mm -hmm. the outside and the inside, between home and outside of home. If, these are, if people aren't aware of these, by the way, they're these little That's ceramic them. dogs that get buried underneath their domestic house, their actual houses, I think, yeah. um, to like protect the inhabitants from like bad and they have, stuff. They have outside. names written They've on got them too. Names like, and they're fierce, wonderful. Fierce is his bark, and I don't remember the other ones, but they're great. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's all about the liminality of the dogs. There's one really good article. The author is escaping me. I'll remember eventually, or I could email it to you to put it in the yep. description. But there's a really great article talking about the liminality of dogs between the civilized and the wild, since Ooh. dogs are one of the earliest yeah. domesticated animals, and, and, and domesticated in a different way than like sheep and goats are. Um, the way they're talked about in texts as existing both within and without cities is really interesting. And so it's all about, it's, it's all about this mediation between categories mm -hmm. um, and the liminality of them, which makes it, that's a, that's a different, that's a very difficult yeah, topic to deal with. Like, how do you deal with something that's just yeah. sort of inherently you can't, like, not categorized? Yeah, you, well, you can't pin thing. it down. It's yeah, like kind point, of though. one thing and kind of another. And yeah. Um, so I am going to, we are nearly at the halfway point. Well, the half hour point. Our audience, if you have questions for Kelsey, please put them in the chat. Um, we will only be going another 15 minutes at the most. Uh, so pop them in there and we will ask those. Uh, please tag me at excuse me, at Digital Hammer Lobby to make sure I see them. Uh, Kelsey, I would please like you to tell us about your TikTok activities because that's how I found you yes. and it's amazing. Yeah, so this is my newest, uh, one of my newest ventures. Um, I started in June, July. I think I started in July. It's only been a few months. 
Um, but I started a TikTok channel. It's at wedgie underscore BCE. Um, but I, I start, started first doing um, a sign of the day. So I was trying to, I've, I've been wanting to do some sort of outreach public scholarship project for a while and YouTube was scary for me. I, I'm, I'm very much a YouTube person. I don't listen to podcasts really. I watch YouTube videos mm -hmm. or I have them on in the background when I'm doing everything else. And so I was like, I really want to do YouTube, but long form videos are very intimidating to me. Maybe I'll get there. Do what I do and just get people to come on your YouTube channel and talk I do about really whatever they want. You're already doing that. I don't want to say <laughs> that. Um, so I was trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? Um, and last summer, some of my friends convinced me to finally make a TikTok account. I didn't think it was going to be anything I was interested in. I was under the assumption, incorrectly, that it was for middle school, middle school kids. I was dancing. under that assumption and, too. And, and, I and it is. It is. Dive and I was like, <laughs> I mean, yes, middle school, high school, but also, yeah, wow. But there's a ton of great Fair educational enough. stuff on here too. And so I was trying to figure out how could I possibly do videos to fit into this short form platform mm -hmm. and talk about cuneiform in any sort of meaningful way. And um, so at one point last semester, I, I did a hand copy of a tablet from a picture because there wasn't a, a hand copy. And I realized that that really helped me learn signs or get mm -hmm. signs that hadn't quite stuck in my brain yet. It helped them stick in my brain. And so I was thinking, oh, maybe I should start practicing doing hand copies more. Or maybe I should practice writing on actual clay. Mm -hmm. and maybe that'll help stick in my brain more. And I was like, oh, wait, this is this is a fun idea. This for is the thing. Because, I mean, a lot of what the middle school side of TikTok is into, from my understanding, is like slime videos. These kids like crushing yeah. styrofoam and slime. And writing signs and clay only seems a couple steps Very away from that. And so I was like, oh, okay. Um, that's why I want to do a sign a day. And I thought focusing on the orthography and the actual writing system, as opposed to starting with grammar, is a little bit more accessible because... Mm -hmm. Honestly, I mean, I'm sure some people get into Acadian because they're very interested in grammar. Good for them. That's not how I got into Acadian, and that's not why I'm interested in Acadian. I don't live for grammar. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to break it down that way, I thought, was something that hadn't been done yet that mm -hmm. I have seen. Um, made it more manageable for me. I can just do a sign a day. I have limits around what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to do all of the grammar at once. Um, I don't even talk about grammar very much at all on the channel. Um, but it just seemed like it was a good idea um, to me. And I told some friends about it and they were interested. And mostly mostly my mom was interested because I've tried for years now to explain what I do to my mother. And being, I mean, she's a very intelligent person, but she's not an, a seriologist mm -hmm. and she's not an academic. She taught third grade she can teach third grade math better than anyone and that's about where my math level is at apparently um but i was like oh this would be a great way to like show my mom what introduce I do. her to what i do <laughs> and what, yeah. my and what my, and show my grandparents what i do and so i started it with the intention that it would be for my friends and my family and the first day i had i made the channel i had like 30 followers and i'm like yeah that'll probably be about where it's that's at bad. Um, maybe I'll get up to a hundred if I'm lucky. And then within the first like month, I have like almost 4,000 followers now. Um, it turns out people are very interested in learning cuneiform. Um, and my goal was just, if I could get one person interested in cuneiform, my job was done. And I, I think I've done that. So I anything, anything on top that. of that. Everything is else is just a bonus. I just can't believe it. So it's, it's been fun. It's, it kept me busy over the summer. Um, I'm busy during the semester now, but I'm going to try to keep up with it. Um, but it's I have really to say, fun. when I started YouTube, very similar thought process. Yeah, I was like, yeah. maybe, maybe we'll get a thousand, like within the year, maybe. Yeah. Um, and where are you at now? <laughs> 35, 38, maybe. And our most watched video, I kid you not, is Introduction to Sumerian Grammar, yeah. Lesson 1. Apparently, people are really just genuinely interested in this, and it like yeah. flies in the face of everything I'd ever understood about yeah. academia. I just like, people are interested; they just can't access it. Yeah, and I think part of it too is, 
I mean, like I said, I had been wanting to do some sort of public facing project because mm -hmm. that's how I got interested in things. I get interested in things because I see some random YouTuber talking. One, one of my favorite channels, I'll do a plug for my favorite channels is Defunct Land. Um, I really have always been interested in theme parks, but I love this channel because he talks about theme park rides and attractions that don't exist anymore. That's the whole frame of his thing, things that have closed. And I always just learn so much about things that I had no idea existed. And so that was kind of part of it because, mm -hmm. I mean, I think anyone who creates content of any sort, like what you were doing or what I'm doing, is because we want to see something out there that doesn't exist. Sorry, one second, my, oh, yeah, my yeah. high schooler is home and I've just realized the deadbolt is on the door. So oh, no. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, I'll keep talking. Um, but just that when you have specialized Sorry, knowledge so in something, me. whether I'm it's cuneiform, Akkadian, Sumerian, or theme park attractions that are no longer around, I think there's some sort of obligation to share that specialized knowledge. One, because I think it's interesting and I just want to talk at people about it and anyone who will listen to me i will talk at you like you could probably tell from this interview i just i just like talking to people and if you listen great um and i think that, that the specialized side of things makes things more of an obligation to put that information out there in an accessible way because of things <laughs> uh, there's a lot of different reasons why a seriology is inaccessible and this mm -hmm. is a problem but one of the ways that we can deal with the problem is to put accessible, interesting, fun content out there um, and get people interested and hopefully shift the field into a slightly friendlier, less gate I am direction. all in favor of that, which yeah. I'm sure is a shock to absolutely no one. But oh, I'm so surprised. <laughs> all in favor. Yeah. So we do have some questions so we can get I on those. one from um, someone I know. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Bell. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to start at the top so otherwise yeah, I'll I'm lose people. Um, uh, JS wants to know, how does Gula relate to Nanota, who was a mm. god of war, storm, and agriculture? That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I haven't looked at a lot of the Nanota text. Mm -hmm. um, the one that is immediately coming to mind is the, the when he fights the Ansu bird. I can't think of any like explicit connections between yeah, the two. Yeah, the maybe mythology. there's some that I'm missing, but I'm not Likewise, sure. Likewise, it's been a while. Yes, yeah. don't know. So I'll, I'll have a, if you, if yeah. you know something, if you're if this is like a, a this question, is a, like hint. A, a leading question, let me know because I'll look at it. Um, same uh, commenter. Do we have opinions on Dr. Anus? Uh, fantastic. Um, very fond of his his work it's again been a while since i've read it but that is a very familiar name and i do know that i enjoyed yeah. his work uh yes i always appreciate guest suggestions thank you i will shoot him an email and see if he would be interested um letitia says what are some of your favorite tiktok accounts yeah great question yeah uh i'll have to i'll have to do a follow-up on my account so i can link people easier um oh i like wacky ones um my favorite ones just generally are the ones that are people sharing very specific specialized knowledge which is again part of the draw for me to start a channel because i'm like i i have some specific specialized knowledge maybe mm -hmm. i should share it with people and get it out of my brain um but like um sort of i'll start with people who are related to a seriology um there's one other account that specializes in cuneiform called cuneiforming and he basically he he does he he doesn't do like voiceovers or anything, but he just does nice calming videos of practicing scribal exercises, and he's very good at oh, writing wonderful. signs, and they're very nice to watch. So I recommend him. Um, I also really like Dan McClellan for the biblical side of things. His Second videos are always just so fantastic. Um, he's, and he's really nice and he's, as well when he yeah, responds he's, to people. He's very kind and. I just really like that approach generally. Um, and that, that's something that I have gained a lot from my mentor in undergrad, especially I was at GW. So I worked with Eric Klein and Chris Rolfe. He's wonderful. Love yeah, Eric Klein. And, uh, I, should, I should give a specific shout out to Eric Klein because he's another big reason why I think it's so important to do public scholarship. And I learned a lot from him because he, like, I mean, he's just so great and natural at it. 
Um, but I know how many people who have, have become interested in the field because of like his videos on YouTube or just his lectures. And so, if people I, who are watching are not familiar with Eric, we did. I did an interview with him last summer about um, his book, 1066, 10, no, 1066. Thank you. That's entirely the wrong date. That's the Battle of Hastings. Um, 1177, um, we did an interview with him. He is a lovely, charming man. So go and watch that and then read the book because it's beautifully written. And actually, he just put out a second edition. So. Yeah. Um, and he's working on a prequel or a sequel. Sequel. Uh, not a sequel. A, yeah. He's working on it. Um, I haven't read his new book on Megiddo either. I need to do that. Um, but anyway, so his mentorship and sort of seeing him model what good public scholarship can look like was really important to me, mm -hmm. too. And so seeing people like him and Dan McClellan, who reminds me a lot of Chris Ralston, my other advisor from undergrad, who is very nice and friendly, but doesn't put up with nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really great approach. It, they're not argumentative the way that they deal with data and contentious data at that especially when you do a bible that's a whole nother thing and i uh <laughs> there's a lot there and I, that's scary to me um but dealing with things that people have very very strong feelings about but often feelings that are not backed by data or are misconstruing data all of this and just the way that he deals with things like that is just just the class act and mm -hmm. I really have a lot of respect for him. Okay, and then <laughs> non-related to ancient studies, <laughs> there's, this, there's this one guy who I really like, I don't remember his account, I'll, I'll do a follow-up post on my account so I can link people, but he has this water cistern in his basement and he, he calls it the eel pit and he's raising eels. I've heard about pit. that. It's I so haven't great. watched it, but I've heard about <laughs> it's it. It's so great. <laughs> and he's named all the eels. One's tequila and one's Eli Eliza. They all have puns. And one's, one is not a pun. His name is just like peanut butter or something like that. <laughs> it's just a food. I don't remember. But I just love his videos. And they're just so weird and random. But like, he hasn't where else there. are you going to put like something like that out on the internet? Like that doesn't no, quite true. make sense for YouTube. No, but it's perfect. You need TikTok. to see it. It's very visual. You need a video for it. So it's like these things that I think work so well on this weird platform that is TikTok, that is short form, but also just like the randomness of scrolling through your for you page and seeing things that you don't follow. Like most other social medias, you have to actively like seek someone out to follow them. But just seeing the random things that show up on your for you page or yeah, TikTok's like, like, here, do you like this? And sometimes I'm like, yes. I, I do. I was, <laughs> well, I don't know why, but yes. Yeah. Yes, the I eel, do. The, the eel pit guy has been a recent favorite. Um, there's another, uh, it's a group of people, their channel's called Whistlegrass, but they do like these little doodles and they sing songs while they're doing doodles. And I just, I just really like, I just love it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Alyssa who asks, yeah, how Alyssa. do you deal with applying theory while you're actually in the field on a dig? Good <laughs> question. Do you find the two worlds of theory and actual practice to be compatible? Yes. Alyssa, I have dug with Alyssa multiple times. And so <laughs> Alyssa knows that uh, digging is, it's a whole nother mindset. When you're doing physical labor and hot, you're hot, I've dug in Israel three times, so hot and dirty and just digging. It's hard to keep theory in mind when you're doing these things. And it's really hard for me to look at the big picture personally when I'm when I've been on digs. It's been better the past couple of times I've been on digs because I've been the registrar. So I'm seeing a little bit more of what's going on across the whole site as opposed to just being focused in your one square over the course of several weeks and not really knowing what's going on elsewhere or hearing things here and there. Um, but I think just one of the things that I always keep in the back of my mind is that what we're finding and what we're ultimately going to make arguments about when we publish the field reports or whatever are the behaviors of people and that people were here doing things and that we're finding the remains of what they did. Um, however incomplete those remains are, we're not going to, mm -hmm. like I said, it's important to acknowledge that we're not going to be able to know everything that ever happened, but finding little bits here and there of what people left behind um, and just keeping, keeping the human 
side of things in my head is important to me while I'm digging. Cause it's, it's like I said, it's really easy to get overwhelmed and just seeing all this stuff and you're just tired and busy, but we're ultimately doing this to find out about what people were doing and to keep that in mind. And then, and then you start to notice things about like, okay, when you find a, a potsherd, maybe there's a thumbprint in it. Just think, like little things like yeah. that are really yeah. meaningful and they remind me what ultimately it's all about and to remember that when we talk about theory like i've said like theory is just making things complicated <laughs> but also remembering that there's a mis there's a mystery to it too like yeah we find a thumbprint in a sherd but we're not necessarily going to know who did this mm -hmm. um but we can imagine through focusing on different things, whether it be gender, anything, that we can try to learn a little bit about what life might have been like for this one person who we can't know and we, we don't know, and but we, we want to know. Um, yeah, just, just keeping the human side in mind and that, and also that what we're doing has an impact that's something that i have to remind myself of yeah because it seems like and I, you know i'm self-deprecating about it like studying acadian is not a practical thing to do at all but ultimately like i said before how we think about the past influences the present mm -hmm. and how we live and think about the present influences how we think about the past it's not a unidirectional thing so th reminding myself that this does matter, even if it's just because we're studying fellow humans. And it, 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 it really does matter. That, that's, that's kind of it. Thank you. We have one last question and then we will uh, say goodbye. Um, when you are doing such a deep dive into symbology, such as the example about the beardless figure, do you get any resistance or pushback? I haven't directly yet. I'm sure I will eventually, but people don't like having their assumptions challenged. Um, and there's a very deep assumption that, well, it, it happens more in the text that Shah Reishi, this is the, the term that is usually translated as eunuch, um, that there's a very <laughs> ingrained assumption within Assyriology, at least, for people who work on gender, that Shah Reishis were eunuchs. Mm -hmm. I am not convinced that we have direct evidence for this. There's a couple texts, my advisor is starting to convince me. There's a one text that a sh where a sheep is described as being a Shah Reishi. And I think this is potentially good evidence that maybe it does have to do with some sort of castration or mm -hmm. something like that. Because like, why would you describe a sheep as, if it was just a term denoting a role within the court, why would you call a sheep? Why use it for a sheep, yeah. Um, so I can be convinced, but when we then use that, we, when we use the textual sources to make arguments about visual sources that aren't directly connected, there's no like label saying like, oh, this is a shot reishi. Mm -hmm. We're just seeing a guy without a beard. That's where I have serious methodological concerns. Um, I mean, just generally, I've, I've had a, a little bit of pushback from some older school professors about like, Oh, we, we just know, uh, this is generally not about bearded, beardless, mm -hmm. whatever, but just like, oh, we know they're a man. We know they're a woman. And when I'm asking questions about like, okay, but how do we, how, really, yeah. how do we really, I've gotten some pushback there. Nothing serious, nothing that I can't handle, but also just like, I'm very critical and I will ask questions about it at conferences I, about how, okay, like if we're saying that this person is a woman and we're just basing that off of a name and onomastics is a thing and that's complicated but how can we determine that someone belongs to this category of people based on just a name it's a little bit more complicated than that so anytime we're questioning especially gender people get prickly about gender too but um when we're questioning assumptions of any sort but especially when it comes to gender and non-normative gender, which there's a lot of discourse 
mostly online. I'm not gonna, a lot of this is online too. It's not yeah. real life. It's not, I think we need to separate like what is actual discourse happening in real life with online discourse because this is a separate uh, phenomenon. But that gender as being a complicated thing is something that's modern. Mm-hmm. That, oh, we're making gender complicated now, but it was simpler in the past. They were just men and just women. And anytime we say like, uh, it's not, not that simple. No. People, get, people get mad about that. And like, oh, just saying, claiming that there were trans people in the past or queer people in the past. People don't, people don't like that. <laughs> they're like, oh, these are modern words. Yes, they're modern words. But it's, the, too, it's just, it's too woke. Yeah. Um, Far too woke. Yeah. And just trying to, you know, make, make the, the past is the past. We're trying to make it woke. No, it's about looking at a more holistic picture. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think this is an excellent point to stop. Audience, thank you for coming and watching. Thank you for your questions. Kelsey, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, If anyone is watching this and is interested in learning more about Kelsey, we do have their TikTok account on the description of this video, also their YouTube channel. So I've I've copied all the TikTok videos to YouTube. So if that's those who don't like they're just they're just copies at this point. Um, no, but that's good hopefully, because... eventually, I'll do longer form things, but that's still scary to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. But thank you again. This was lovely. Um, and until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.